the Holocaust. Undoubtedly one of the worst crimes ever committed in history and a lesson we still learn from until today. Some phrase this lesson like this, remember that the Holocaust was legal. The idea is that legality does not equal morality, and on that we can all agree. But was the Holocaust really legal in 1945? Let's take a look at that. Now, in order to answer that question, we need to distinguish between two legal systems, international law and national law. Something can be legal in one of these systems, but illegal in the other. Let's take a look at international law first. The first problem we have with international law of the time is that it didn't even know the word genocide. The word was only introduced to the world in 1944 by Raphael Lemkin, who also invented the word. But the thing is, it only entered international law after World War II through the Genocide Convention. So international law at the time didn't know the offense of committing genocide, and so that offense just didn't exist. The other problem is sovereignty. International law of the time still perceived sovereignty as it was perceived back when kings and queens ruled the world. So you could do to your population pretty much whatever you wanted as long as you stayed within the boundaries of your state. But that's the catch, within the boundaries of your state. Because back in 1928, states agreed that they would not use war as an instrument of foreign policy. But Germany had done exactly that for World War II. Now, why is this relevant for the Holocaust and its legality? Because the Holocaust was connected to World War II. How? The Nazis used territory which they occupied through the war to build their extermination camps there. So extermination camps such as for example Auschwitz and Treblinka were located in German-occupied Poland. Since the entire occupation was part of the illegal act of war, and war was illegal because of the 1928 kellogg bryant Pact, the occupation was also illegal, so everything they did as part of it was illegal as well. Now note, this only makes everything illegal because it was connected to the war. We know that the war and the occupation were definitely illegal for the Germans because the International Military Tribunal, or the Nuremberg Trial, said so. So the Nuremberg Trial had jurisdiction over wars and violations with international agreements and it confirmed what was pretty obvious, that the Germans were not allowed to wage that war in the first place. Now you may remember that they also tried key Nazi figures for crimes against humanity, but since that was the first time that individuals were tried for this crime, it is questionable whether that was really representative of international law at the time or whether it was more a development of it. Now, even though we can make an argument that things were illegal at the time, there are still some big shortcomings with this analysis. The biggest one is that it doesn't cover everything, because the Germans also committed crimes against the Jews within Germany and prior to the waging of World War II. All of these things are not covered by this analysis. So does this mean that under international law, everything else that wasn't connected to the war was legal? You could get around this by using a device of the natural law world called the Rodberg Formula. The Rodberg Formula says that a law is invalid when its violation of justice reaches an intolerable degree. Since the rules of international law of the time would have permitted a genocide to occur as long as it occurred within the boundaries of the state committing it, that would definitely have been an intolerable violation of justice. But note that this is a merger of law and morality, which is controversial at best in the jurisprudential world, so we can't rely on that alone. So the problem with this analysis is that some acts would have remained legal under international law. Now let's take a look at national law and where things look differently there. There are two ways you could argue that the Holocaust was illegal under national law. One is that the entire regime was illegal and that the Nazis didn't have a legal system because every law they purported to make was just so immoral. Or you could argue that they did have valid laws, but the Holocaust was illegal under those laws. Let's first take a look at the argument that Nazi law was so immoral that it couldn't possibly be law. This is once again a natural law argument that isn't without controversy, and it assumes, such as Fuller says it, that a legal system needs a legal morality in order to be a legal system. What he means by that is that the legal system's rules need to strive towards justice and decency, and Nazi laws clearly didn't do that. So you could argue that the Nazis didn't have a legal system which could then legalize the Holocaust, so everything was illegal. But once again, this is controversial. So what if we accept that they did have valid laws? Well, then we need to look at the German defense that is called the Befehlsnotstand. The defense can be raised when a crime is committed under the order of a superior. The defense goes something like this. I knew that the order I got was illegal, but I followed it anyway because I feared severe punishment if I didn't. The people working in extermination camps were following orders. Now we're discussing orders and not laws here because the final solution was an order made by Hitler after the Wannsee conference. Heinrich Himmler, the leader of the Schutzstaffel, which is the unit which staffed the extermination camps, then told his people that this order basically had the force of law because it came from Hitler himself. But technically we're talking about an order, so that's why we need to look at whether or not the following of the order was legal. For the defense to be successful, you need to satisfy both elements of it, the known illegality of the order and the fear of severe punishment. 
Let's take a look at these in turn. First, the known illegality of the order your superior gave to you. Well, it doesn't take a law degree to figure out that murdering people is illegal. So yeah, they would have known that. So secondly, fear of severe harm. Well, the defense was successful in early Nazi trials because we assumed that this fear existed, but research has actually shown that the punishments were quite lenient and you could easily transfer to a different position. So the biggest fear was social ostracism within the units themselves. And that is not enough to then satisfy the defense. You could nonetheless have held a subjective fear which can be enough to satisfy the defense, but those will likely be rare individual cases. While you can thereby argue that the acts that were committed in the extermination camps were illegal, it is important to remember no court in Nazi Germany would have interpreted the law like this because they applied the law however the regime wanted them to apply it. Now that we've looked at both national and international law at the time, let's take a look at a few issues the law used to have and how we've addressed them. The first one is that the law used to not have a word for what happened during the Holocaust. Things had to be framed as either being connected to the war or as being individual murders under national law. The issue is that genocide isn't accurately described by either because it is more than murder because it is acts committed with an intent to destroy an entire group. So that's why we needed a new offense which was introduced through the genocide convention. The second issue with the old law is that the world is no longer ruled by kings and queens and castles with absolute authority. Instead, there are limits on what states can do within their boundaries and modern international law reflects that. So to take it back to the tweet which originally inspired this little legal investigation of mine, no, the Holocaust was probably not entirely legal under the law of the time back in 1945. But that of course doesn't invalidate the message that the person is trying to bring across, which is that legality does not equal morality. But thanks to our analysis, we can actually add a second lesson to this. The mere illegality of something isn't enough protection, it needs to be backed up by having a meaningful remedy. Because in Nazi Germany, you wouldn't have been able to persuade a court to adopt the interpretation of the law that I just gave you, because the Nazi courts declared the law to be whatever the regime wanted it to be even if the actual law didn't really align with that declaration of the law. So that shows that mere illegality is no indicator that you are well protected. We need to look at what remedies people actually have. 